show some swishy, billowing, dramatic capes. Certainly not me. I've been wanting to make capes for a long time. And of course, because I am a broke college student, I decided to take a pattern from the Keystone Jacket and Dress Cutter, since it's available for free online. You can get the pattern from the link down below. I chose the plain cape because though I want maximum sausage, I am, again, a broke college student, and thus wants to keep the yardage to a minimum. Besides, this plain cape is anything but plain, as you'll soon see. It's really very simple if you already have your bodice block pattern. The book does have patterns for shirt waists, but I have my bodice block pattern already, so I'm using that. You just lay down the back bodice and mark the end of the shoulder seam. Pivot to make an arc and lay down the front bodice so that the end of that shoulder seam is on the arc and the mid back and mid front is perpendicular to each other. Then we basically just measure how long we want our cape to be and scoop it around. As you can see, this is anything but plain because making this pattern took most of my scratch paper from last semester. And after painstakingly piecing letter says paper after letter says paper to fill this pattern, we can cut away. Look, that's my room. That's basically taking all of my room. Okay, here we go. I'm using this wonderful purple fleece because even the wool would have been best. I repeat, I am a broke college student. Fleece is what I have in my budget, and so fleece I would use. Besides, this swoosage is magnificent, so no complaints here from me. Then we're basically done with the cape part of this cape, but I wanted the hood, so I'm measuring the neckline of a cape. Then I drafted a hood pattern, somewhat loosely and willy-nilly, but it worked fine, so that's alright, I guess. I made four of these hood pieces, remembering to add seam allowances this time. Not that I forgot with the cape, but you know, remembering things is always good. Then I just pinned two pieces together and sewed it to make a hood, and repeated that to make a lining. Then I notched the seams and pressed the hem because I am trying to masquerade as a proper seamstress. Then I lined the lining. Is it really a lining if it's the same material as the outside of the hood? Um, whatever. Okay, then I lined the lining with the hood, not that there's any difference between the two, and sewed them together. I then remembered that the edges of the cape had to be hung before I set the hood in, if I wanted nice finished edges, so I did that with a herringbone stitch. The fleece was already so bulky and it won't fray, so the hemming is literally just for aesthetics. Then I set the hood in, with some data analysis running in the background. I kind of messed up the neckline measuring thing, so the hood doesn't fit perfectly into the neckline, but I just pleated them and called it a day. More sausage, right? While well, the data analysis is running in the background, and the backstitching of the hood commences, let's talk about purple and the Victorian era, shall we? At first I wanted this cape to be about Stephanie Brown, who is spoiler from DC Comics for that minuscule percentage of you who cared about her, because I am a nerd in every sense of the way. But then I remembered roughly that the first synthetic dye was found in the Victorian era, and that it was purple. And before I knew it, I've gone down that rabbit hole and emerged victorious. So yes, the first synthetic dye was discovered by William Henry Perkin in 1856. He discovered it while trying to make quinine, which is a compound, which is a compound found in chinchona trees and used to treat malaria. He did not find quinine, though other medications are available now for malaria, but he did accidentally create Movine. It really is incredible to see how this one synthetic dye revolutionized dyeing, basically. People were going on a craze, even Queen Victoria and Empress Eugene were wearing this so-called mauve purple. And it didn't stop there. It's almost like Movine unlocked the secret of synthetic dye, and more and more and more of synthetic dyes were created. If you delve into the chemistry of it, it's actually quite fascinating. You would normally hear that these synthetic dyes were called aniline dyes, but what is aniline and how did they manage to create these amazing colors? Aniline is this organic compound. It consists of an aromatic ring, six carbons ordered in a six-sided ring, with bonds between each of the carbons being this fascinating structure that gives them extra stability. And it is this structure that causes them to absorb certain wavelengths of light making your eyes only see the other wavelengths and thus perceiving that that object is a certain color. 
Changing around the other groups or varying how many rings there are in a compound can cause different wavelengths to be absorbed, generating different colors. And the best thing about them is that they bind readily to silk and wool. Now that the hood and the purple is set, I went up to do the humming, only to remember that all the sausage came with a price. It's a curved hem, and thus humming it is going to be difficult. I decided to do the gathering stitch method, not that I know if it's historically accurate, but this I'm sure is going to be historically accurate. Not having a sewing machine, I have to do all the basting by hand, and me only being able to do this in stolen time in between my problem sets took me days to do it. I didn't even have to do it, it's purely aesthetic, but I committed to humming this thing, and so I will hum it, days spent basting or no. And then, of course, I had to spend even more days during the herringbone stitches throughout the hem because there are yards and yards and yards of hem to be done. So, while sewing Belinda is wrestling with all of that hem, let's talk about the incredible man that is William Henry Perkin. The story is that he discovered Moveen while he was washing his lap equipment, which was very important. Do wash your lap equipments. In his many, many, many trials to make quinine, he accidentally found a substance uh, that seems to dye silk purple, and it dyes it easily, and the color most importantly stayed on the silk. Purple dyes are famously difficult to make, making them very expensive, and Perkin at age 18, 1 8, 18, saw that this is going to be a great venture, and just quit this laboratory that he was working in. Did I mention he was 18 when he did this? 1 8? 18? Yeah? Just checking. The first few batches of Moveen had really low results to ingredients ratio, which is not good when you're trying to mass produce this thing. So Perkins went and did his own experiments in the attic back room somewhere in his father's house. He went and problem solved all of this issue about this compound as a dye. Remember that no one had actually done this before, there was never any synthetic dyes before, and no one actually knew what was going on. His own teachers did not care about this and thought this is some ridiculous venture. But he persisted and found ways around every single problem. The intrigue doesn't end there, it does not. He patented this chemical, right, Moveen? But the thing is, <laughs> the thing that really caught my mind is, the methods that he gave in the patent is not reproducible. Now, this is not good science. You're supposed to have reproducible results all the time before your discovery is considered proper science. But he definitely can make Moveen again and again and again if his factory is of any indication. So why do people can't do it? Basically, the problem is that there are several types of Moveen, a little difference between the placement of one group called metal. The results from the methods that Perkins gave does not give the same type as the sample that he gave which has confounded scientists for decades now. It was this sort of holy grail of mystery that no one could solve. Until Dr. John Plater of Aberdeen University gave an explanation that, in my humble opinion as a non-chemist, found most reasonable. Perkins was a businessman first, and a scientist second. He lied. He lied. He didn't want his competitors to know the exact way of making this highly popular, readily profitable compound. And so he lied. <laughs> Mr. Perkins. Now after all that excitement, let's do on some cups, just regular metal ones, because by this point, I really just want this project to be done. I really liked it, and you might say that it's too late in the season to start wearing capes, but don't worry, it's still very cold here, no matter that they say it's spring. And again, this sausage is magnificent, and I really will have to gather up the courage to just wear this everywhere. I hope you enjoyed this cake making adventure, and that little side trip to chemistry and the history of movie. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up so that I know to make more of these videos that reveal what a nerd I am. And if you want some more crafty plus nerdy content, why not check this math filled quilting video. See you all next time!